Across the country, young men were being shot down in cold blood. The killer struck unexpectedly. His attacks were unprovoked. His sole motivation was racial hatred. And after he killed, he vanished. When a sniper in Utah started targeting African-American men for death, authorities launched a massive investigation. With scant clues and no witnesses, they found the odds stacked against them. And they had no idea where the killer would strike next. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Civil rights violations fall under federal jurisdiction. So the killings become the FBI's business. The investigation soon grew into a nationwide manhunt for a roving serial killer. Salt Lake City, Utah. On an August night in 1980, four youths walked through Liberty Park enjoying the last days of their summer. 20-year-old Ted Fields and 18-year-old David Martin had just finished choir practice. Terry Elrod had just begun dating David a few weeks earlier and had set up her friend Karma Ingersoll with Ted. This was their first date. The four had met to jog in the park, but decided to walk and talk instead. They were too preoccupied with each other to notice a man watching them through the scope of his rifle. When David Martin dropped to his knees, the others thought he was joking. Then Terry felt something sting her arm, and she knew he was deadly serious. Ted told the girls to take cover while he tried to help his friend. Then he too was shot down. Police and rescue units raced to the scene. David Martin, barely alive, was rushed to the hospital, but died hours later of three gunshot wounds. Ted Fields, the son of a police chaplain, was dead. Witnesses told police they heard shots coming from an abandoned building across the street. But no one saw the shots fired, and no one saw the gun. Detectives spoke with Terry Elrod at the nearby trauma center where she was being treated for her wound. She was still badly shaken, but told investigators what she could recall. When she and her friends reached the intersection, she thought she heard firecrackers. David crumpled and she felt a sting on her arm. She saw blood, then realized that David was seriously wounded. As she told her story, she recalled something that had happened a few minutes before the shooting. The group was almost hit by a car traveling the wrong way down a one-way street. But she could not identify the make, model, or license plate. And she never saw the driver. Salt Lake City Detective Don Bell didn't know why the youths were targeted. These were young boys. They'd never been in trouble with the police. Uh, we didn't have an outstanding motive. Uh, we didn't know whether it was something related to the girls, whether something related to the boys, or just a case of mistaken identity. In the morning, police returned to the crime scene to conduct a more thorough search. In a field across from the park, police found tire tracks. Technicians photographed and measured them.
Close to the tracks, police recovered six that bullet one. casings. Right Witnesses said they had heard the gunfire coming from the abandoned building. Now detectives believe that what they heard were the echoes. The shooter had apparently hidden in the bushes, lying in wait for the forcer to walk into range. Police matched the casings to the bullets that killed the two young men. They sent the evidence to the FBI ballistics lab in Washington, D.C. to determine the type of gun the assassin used. That would take time. Investigators tried to find other leads to the killer's identity. Bell started with the family members of the victims. In particular, Terry Elrod's father seemed like a possible suspect. You looking for me? Teach Elrod led an outlaw biker gang and was upset that Terry was dating a black man. The detective spent three days tracking him down. When they found him, he agreed to come in for questioning. Investigators were very thorough with him. He said he'd been on a whitewater rafting trip and that friends could back up his story. What? I did? Just have a I did? Just have a What am I, an arrest or something? Detectives weren't convinced. They demanded Elrod take a polygraph test. Find out right now. Have a seat. He would pass, and his alibi was corroborated. Police had no more suspects. They returned to the Liberty Park crime scene to canvas the neighborhood. One resident, Gary Spicer, told investigators he had seen something suspicious earlier that evening. A car had parked close to his home and he went out to investigate. He saw a man packing man, or unpacking something in the trunk. What are you doing? What are you doing in my neighborhood? Spicer asked what he was doing, but the stranger simply shut the trunk and drove away. Spicer didn't see his face, but told investigators that he was a slender white man. He described the car as a Camaro with chrome mags. Yeah. Detectives thought the information was promising, since the car was parked close to where they had earlier found the tire tracks. Two days after the murders, police seemed no closer to solving it. Press coverage intensified, and community outrage escalated. We'd never had a homicide like this in Salt Lake City. We had never had people just gunned down, especially young people gunned down in the middle of an intersection. The general public wanted to know about the killings. Uh, they wanted to know if they were race related. With the possibility of civil rights violations, concern grew in the Justice Department. Assistant U.S. Attorney Steve Snarr was brought in to monitor the case. Members of the black community were particularly concerned and were somewhat vocal about whether this was racially motivated but at the time, there were no clear answers. FBI Special Agent Curtis Jensen from the Salt Lake City office was assigned to assist local investigators. When I first heard about this case, I was incensed. It caused a great deal of concern among the, not just the black community, but all of the community, community in Salt Lake City. They felt that there was an assassin loose and it could happen again. As community pressure grew, test results from the FBI ballistics lab in Washington, D.C. offered investigators a fresh lead. Examiners determined that the weapon had been a six-shot rifle, either a Marlin or Glenfield 3030. After searching gun shops and classified ads for recent purchases, investigators assembled 150 weapons that matched the description. They tested each one. None had fired the bullets found at the scene. 
By now, it was likely that the assailant had fled the area and perhaps the state. So the FBI sent out nationwide teletypes to local and federal agencies describing details of the crime, including the weapon and shell casings. With still no suspects, a $50,000 reward was offered to promote the public's help. Calls flooded in. All were checked, none panned out. Most who came forward were after the money and had nothing solid to offer. But one showed a hint of promise. A young woman claimed she might have met the killer. She identified herself as Mickey, a part-time prostitute. She was reluctant to talk to police until Detective Bell assured her she wouldn't be charged if she came in for an interview. Uh, she was actually a struggling college student, and so she would go out two days a week and work uh, on one of the streets that a lot of the prostitutes worked on. She told the detective about a man she had met sometime in August, close to the time of the killings. Mickey was walking down the street when a man in a Camaro pulled up and asked if she wanted to party. She hadn't planned on turning any tricks that day, so she said no. He said he'd make it worth her while. She relented since she needed the money and the man didn't seem threatening. He spoke with a southern accent and introduced himself as Bill Hagman. He drove her to the Regal Inn Motel. Just get ready to go. In the room, Mickey noticed that Hagman had weapons she described two long guns that stood in the corner and one silver handgun. Hagman didn't talk about them, and Mickey was afraid to ask. She also said that the man had tattoos on both arms. On his left forearm was an American eagle, on the right, the Grim Reaper. After their stay at the motel, Hagman offered to treat her to lunch, then drive her home. At an intersection on the way to the restaurant, he pulled out his handgun and said something she would never forget. What's with this guy? He explained that he was a contract hitman for the Ku Klux Klan and said, do you want me to kill those niggers? Uh, she says, put the gun away. She was very concerned about what he was going to do. He then says, it's real easy. I've done work like this before. You just walk up, you shoot him, you walk on. Everybody's concerned with him falling. No one pays any attention to you. Mickey was terrified, but was able to talk him out of killing the pedestrian. Afterward, Hagman dropped her at her apartment, where he briefly met her roommate. Bell wondered if Mickey was reliable or just another false witness looking for the reward money. Even if her story was true, Hagman's role in the case was unclear. Did it have anything to do with her killing or was this just a bad guy that was blowing through town and trying to, you know, uh, make this part-time hooker be impressed with his ability of being a hitman or something? If Mickey could identify the long guns she saw in the motel room, her story would have more weight especially if she identified them as either a Glenfield or Marlin rifle, which the FBI had determined to be the murder weapon. Mickey told Bell she didn't know much about firearms and didn't look at the weapons for very long. The detective insisted she try. But the guns she chose from the photos didn't match either murder weapon. Mickey's story seemed like another dead end. Despite his doubts, Bell made an appointment for her and her roommate to come back and work with a police sketch artist. Meanwhile, investigators continued to pursue the hundreds of leads that poured in. Public pressure was mounting. The community feared that the sniper could strike again. And police didn't know that he already had. Three weeks after the double murder of two young black men in Salt Lake City, the killer's identity remained unknown. Then the investigation took an unexpected turn. Local authorities received a response to the national telex sent by the FBI. 
Police in Cincinnati were investigating a similar unsolved double murder that happened two months earlier. On a late evening in June 1980, 13-year-old Dante Brown and 14-year-old Daryl Lane walked to the candy store close to their homes. They never saw the man watching them. Danger struck quickly. They didn't have a chance. Cincinnati police raced to the scene. They found Darrell Lane dead. Dante was still alive, but in serious condition. Both boys had been shot twice. Officers talked to onlookers, hoping someone had seen something, but no one had. Detective Mike O'Brien of the Cincinnati police recalls that the coroner provided investigators with their first clue. The coroner responded to the scene, and he had already performed a post-mortem examination on one of the young men and was able to tell the trajectory and the direction the shots were fired in. The coroner pointed them towards the train trestle 75 feet away. Police combed the trestle. Among the overgrowth, they recovered four spent rifle casings. Ballistics analysts determined that they were shot from a 44 Ruger carbine rifle. Months had passed since the double murder in Cincinnati, and detectives had no suspects. No one knew why someone would want to kill the teenagers. This wasn't the typical homicide when you have two children, 13, 14 year old children that are shot sniper style shooting with no clear motive, uh, two children on their way to a candy store. Uh, it, it obviously had the city and the neighborhood in an uproar. When O'Brien heard about the Salt Lake City sniper, he invited the detectives to Cincinnati to compare the cases more closely. To Salt Lake City Detective Bell, the connection was significant. It revealed a breed of killer not encountered before 1980. Once we were made aware of this information, uh, we were pretty much convinced that we were dealing with the same killer from back east. And this was actually our real first uh, involvement with what is commonly now referred to as a, as a traveling serial killer. Uh, this was a new concept to everybody, not just out in Salt Lake. It was a new concept anywhere in the country that killers would just travel across the country. While police from both states met in Cincinnati to search for answers, Detective Bell in Salt Lake City followed up on the slim lead from the prostitute named Mickey. She told him that she'd spent time with a man named Bill Hagman at the Regal Inn Motel. He carried guns and drove a Camaro like one described by witnesses close to the crime scene. At the motel, Bell found a registration card signed by Hagman and dated August 16th, four days before the murders. The address Hagman listed was in Kentucky. We had the FBI run the name through their entire database. They had nothing on that name. So we felt fairly confident that everything he'd put on this registration slip was, was fraudulent. FBI labs in Washington, D.C. dusted the card for latent fingerprints, but found none. They also analyzed Hagman's handwriting and noted some unique characteristics that would make it easy to identify. They had no proof he was the killer, but he was the only lead they had. Although it was a long shot, a team of 20 detectives spread out to search other motels in the area. They carried copies of Hagman's Name Regal Inn registration they card, hoping to match his handwriting in the event he used a different alias. Agent Jensen recalls the extensive search. 
and they conducted a search of all motel rooms from Ogden, which is 30 miles no north of Salt Lake, to Provo, which is 30 miles south. And they located about eight motels where this individual had stayed using false names, each one different, using phony addresses and using false license numbers for his car. Local investigators also discovered the suspect had stayed at the scenic motel on August 20th, the day of the murders. It was just nine blocks from the shootings in Liberty Park. Though Hagman used different names at each motel, the FBI labs confirmed the handwriting was the same. One of the cards yielded a fingerprint. But a check in the National Fingerprint Database turned up nothing. Is this one of your motel registrations? At the yes, Sandman Motel, they got another here break. And help me out for a second. Detectives discovered that his registration card listed a Camaro with its license plate number. Okay, now, <clears throat> I see a license number. But a second here. license number was written in the margin by the motel's owner. Yes, I do. I, I wrote that number there. That's, that's the correct number. He must have been in his late 70s, early 80s. He went out every night around 3 o'clock in the morning and would take all of his motel registration slips and walk by all the cars and check their license plate numbers against what were put on the cards because he was so sure that his guests were going to steal a pillow or a pillowcase. When the owner checked the plates on Hagman's Camaro against his registration, the numbers didn't match. So he recorded the correct Kentucky plates in the margin of the card. A DMV search revealed the license plate and the Camaro were registered to a member of a prominent Louisville, Kentucky family. The Salt Lake City detectives shared their discovery with detectives in Cincinnati. Yeah, this is Michael Ryan. How you doing? They immediately responded to Louisville and made contact with the police agency there and tracked down the actual registered owner of this car. He had, in fact, sold the car to another person uh, some months before. The Louisville man showed detectives the sales receipt. Police took down the name of the purchaser, the car's mileage, and its brand of tires. But their troubles weren't over. The purchaser had used a false name. The seller worked with a police sketch artist to render a composite of the buyer, a slender white man with a Kentucky accent. Back in Salt Lake City, Mickey and her roommate were also providing detectives with a composite sketch of the man who called himself Hagman. At the same time, I met with Mickey, the part-time hook, and her roommate. And her roommate was actually a, 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 an artist, a student who uh, was studying art. And she did a freehand drawing to begin with. And then we asked her if she could work with our composite, and she did. And she put together a composite of this man. Hey, Ron. When the composite drawing from Louisville arrived in Utah, detectives compared the two renderings. They were remarkably similar. Investigators now had the face of the suspected serial killer. Investigators hunted a serial killer who had murdered two young African Americans in Cincinnati and two more in Salt Lake City. They now had a sketch of their suspect, but lead detective Don Bell still had no name and no hard evidence connecting him with the murders. We didn't have anything to charge him with. However, we did find a motel that he stayed here in Salt Lake for two nights. Since he left without paying, we immediately applied for a warrant uh, which was granted, and we charged him with defrauding an innkeeper, or failure to pay. Uh, we issued that warrant under every single name that had been found on every single motel registration card. The FBI entered the warrant, the license plate, and all of his aliases into the NCIC, the National Crime Information Center computer database that links over 57,000 law agencies nationwide. 
On September 25, 1980, over a month after the Salt Lake City murders, the FBI database paid off. When officers in Boone County, Kentucky, arrived at a local motel to arrest a pair of jewelry thieves, the manager told them that one of his patrons was complaining about the lights and noise from their vehicles. Seven, eight police cars in the parking lot with the red lights going and the radios blaring and, and another person living in this motel took offense at being disturbed by all this noise and called the manager's office and said, what are the cops doing there and how come it's so noisy and, you know, I'm going to leave if you don't quiet down. And so the manager went out and approached uh, one of the Boone County officials and said, you know, my tenant is really upset that you're causing all this trouble. When the sergeant asked who was complaining, the night manager told them that the calls were coming from room 80. Perturbed, the sergeant ran the license plate of the Camaro registered for the man in that room. The computer check, tied into the FBI database, turned up the warrant from Utah. Boone County sheriffs went to room 80. A slender white male with a southern accent answered the door. Inside, officers saw two shotguns on the bed. They cuffed him and brought him in for questioning. This time, the fugitive registered with his real name, Joseph Paul Franklin. They notified Salt Lake City investigators that they had their man. Detective Bell and his colleague were on the next plane to Kentucky. But when they arrived, Boone County Sheriff's had alarming news. The fugitive had escaped from his low security room. At some time during the interview, uh, the detective briefly leaves the room to get a, something to drink for this subject and himself. And it's at that point that this individual makes his escape out the window and is gone. Investigators still held his Camaro, his weapons and wallet, containing his driver's license and photo. Salt Lake City Detective Bell recalled how closely the photo matched the two composites. Looking at that license, it was almost eerie. It almost looked like that the composite that had been built in Kentucky and the composite that I built out here in Salt Lake, that we had done it using Joseph Paul Franklin's driver's license. The suspected serial killer was still one step ahead. The FBI issued a federal warrant for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Investigators hoped the resources of the FBI could stop the killer before he struck again. The fugitive's face and description flooded the media nationwide. Agent Jensen spearheaded the manhunt for the FBI. He was almost immediately put on the 10 most wanted list because of the notoriety and because of the seriousness of the crime. The fact that he was a suspect not only in this uh, crime, but in the, the assassination of a number of black people all across the United States. These were cases that hadn't been solved. To make the most wanted fugitives list, Franklin's file was reviewed among hundreds of others. Special agents at FBI headquarters decide the 10 most wanted based on a suspect's immediate danger to society, that the suspect won't stop killing until he's caught. News of the killer's escape brought a flurry of sightings, including one from a Kentucky teenager. He said a man had offered him $100 to take him across the river to a shopping mall in Cincinnati. Investigators swarmed the mall to interview anyone who thought they'd seen him. They discovered the suspected serial killer had purchased new clothes and had his hair cut and dyed. Franklin had changed his appearance and still had a source of cash. Back in Kentucky, evidence technicians scoured the Camaro for clues. They took photos of its tires, hoping to match them with tread marks found near the crime scene in Salt Lake City. They matched. For Detective Bell, it was a major breakthrough. The tires 
were sort of a new prototype that were only being released east of the Mississippi. So for tires to show in a dirt field in Salt Lake City, they would have had to have been purchased at that time east of the Mississippi that placed that car with that man in our city. At the FBI ballistics lab in Washington, D.C., examiners analyzed the weapons Franklin had left behind. They hoped to determine that one of the guns was the murder weapon. He had two rifles and two handguns. The FBI was able to compare the ballistics of these weapons with the bullets that were recovered from the victim's bodies. These did not match. The FBI also searched the NCIC database for criminal records and outstanding warrants for Joseph Paul Franklin. They discovered that Franklin had legally changed his name. Have some more information. What do you got? His birth name was James Clayton Vaughn. The information allowed investigators to dig more deeply into his past. Yep. Joseph Paul Franklin, a suspected serial killer targeting African-American men, had escaped from police in Kentucky and was still on the run. The FBI had determined that he changed his name from James Clayton Vaughn. Agents and local detectives traced his history to his hometown in Birdtown, Alabama. They spoke with people who knew him. For Cincinnati detective Michael Bryan, a clearer picture of the fugitive started to emerge. Birdtown is described as basically one side of the track is black and the other side is white. And so there was a lot of racial tension in his upbringing. Uh, there was a lot of uh, problems between whites and blacks in that area. His mother had relatives that had been in World War II on the side of Nazi Germany. Franklin, uh, at one point, had said he had read Mein Kampf and was very impressed with this writing. Joseph Paul Franklin had selected his new name to honor one of his heroes, Hitler's chief propagandist, Paul Joseph Goebbels. The FBI tracked his movements over the previous year and found that they coincided with several unsolved bank robberies. That, that's him. That's, that's him. Agents also learned that two years earlier, he had sent a letter threatening to kill President Jimmy Carter because of his pro-civil rights views. The president was currently campaigning in the South, where Franklin had last been spotted. The election was just weeks away. If Franklin was going to make good on his threat, it would be soon. Detective Bell remembers that the FBI and Secret Service rushed into action. Well, they decided that Joseph Paul Franklin, also James Clayton Vaughn, was definitely a threat to President Carter because he had written that he would like to kill him. So they passed pictures of Joseph Paul Franklin in every city that the president was going to visit. The FBI had to get to Franklin before Franklin got to the president. We were able to, through yeah. contacting yeah. his friends, determine that during the process of his flight, he was selling his blood plasma to obtain money to live on. And as a result of that, we sent bulletins out to all of the blood plasma centers in the southeastern part of the United States. Clinics across the South received packets from the FBI with information on the killer, now suspected of murder in at least seven states. Mm. Ms. Jackson, are you okay? I'm just so dizzy. Okay. Well, lay down there for a minute. It's going to take just a few minutes to... On October 28th, Franklin entered a clinic in the Tampa area to sell his plasma. The technician prepping him recognized the tattoos from the FBI packet, the Grim Reaper and the American Eagle. Is this your first time giving blood? Oh my gosh, I'm so dizzy. Yeah. Franklin figured selling his blood was safer than robbery for a man on the run. I do it all the time. He was wrong. There is? The technician phoned the number the FBI provided. Federal agents surrounded the clinic and moved in to arrest Franklin. This time, 
there would be no mistakes. The killer went quietly without a fight. Franklin was taken to Salt Lake City to stand trial for the murders of Ted Fields and David Martin. But Detective Bell suddenly found the entire homicide case in jeopardy. The county attorney didn't feel that we had a strong enough case. It was purely circumstantial as far as he was concerned, and he wasn't willing to go to court on, on just a purely circumstantial case. But the federal government, uh, through the FBI, decided to step in at that time, and they felt that they had a very good, strong case to bring civil rights violations against him. The civil rights conviction would present obstacles of its own. Prosecutors would have to prove not only that he had committed the homicides in Utah, but that he was motivated out of racial hatred. The FBI held suspected serial killer Joseph Paul Franklin in Salt Lake City, while federal prosecutors built a case to prove his murders were racially motivated. Agents re-interviewed his associates, family, and two ex-wives in order to get a clearer picture of Franklin's racial beliefs. Agent Jensen sent his team to Franklin's hometown of Birdtown, Alabama. We were able to go back and meet with people that knew him. And uh, we were able to develop a, a, a history of him, if you will, as to what he was like. The fact that he had been associated with the uh, Ku Klux Klan, he'd been associated with the American Nazi Party, the fact that he had been arrested a number of times for disorderly conduct, and uh, in some instances because he possessed a weapon. Prosecutors pursued witnesses who could testify to Franklin's whereabouts and his racist views. At one motel, a manager agreed to speak at trial about his encounter with Franklin. The police had found a motel where he had stayed before the uh, shooting took place. And he'd gone and registered, he'd registered in the office and then he went to the room, pulled down the covers and found a uh, black hair in the, in the bed. This upset him greatly, and so he uh, became irate, went to, back to the office and yelled and screamed and, and made a number of racial statements against black people. Wherever they went, investigators found witnesses who remembered Franklin's car. Assistant U.S. Attorney Steve Snarr recalls that Franklin's Camaro proved crucial to his case. The car that Mr. Franklin was driving was unique. It had a unique color. It had red uh, pinstriping that was a custom kind of striping. It also had unique interior features and uh, non-standard tires and other features that were noticeable to various witnesses who had observed the car in the Salt Lake area. And he pulled up and asked The investigative the team also interviewed two young women who had ridden in Franklin's Camaro. Yeah, really we came up with two girls, uh, a lady by the name of Sandra and yeah, another one by the name of Rhonda who actually at 4 o'clock, 4, 4.30, quarter to 5 on the day of the killing, were hitchhiking a couple of blocks away from the park. Uh, this man in the Camaro picked them up, and they needed to get to the downtown bank to deposit their paycheck before it closed at 5. As they got in the car, Franklin asked them if black people hung out in the park. One of the girls, who was dating a black man, said yes. Before he dropped them off, he handed them printed cards that said, take off your clothes. Bell sent the cards to the FBI lab, and examiners were able to conclusively match them to similar cards found in the glove compartment of Franklin's Camaro. The timing of the women's story was also compelling. They actually saw him again that night, a block and a half away from the park at 8.30. So little by little, we're putting him almost in the park at the same time the victims were. At the Salt Lake County Jail, Franklin was held in a double lockup since he had previously escaped from police custody. Close three. While there, he became friendly with Robert Herrera, an inmate serving time for burglary. Herrera had more recently been disciplined for brawling with a black inmate. Although the fight was not racially motivated, 
Franklin assumed Herrera held the same hatred of African Americans. He looked to Herrera as a confidant. Agent Jensen recalls the importance of this relationship. He told Herrera, he confessed to Herrera that he had shot the two joggers in Salt Lake City and also confessed to a, a homicide in Oklahoma City. Herrera arranged a meeting with the FBI and local investigators. He had a proposition for them. How's it going? Herrera would become a federal witness against Franklin if the state would guarantee his early release. Franklin told Herrera why he shot the couples in Liberty Park. He said he believed people of different races should never mix. When Franklin saw the black men walking with white girls in the park, he felt they should die. Investigators were not convinced they could trust Herrera. A confession to a convict would not ensure a successful prosecution. We have, to, we have to coordinate out here, too. When investigators requested more information, Herrera told them about Franklin's whereabouts following the Salt Lake City murders. Well, I can tell you what he did after the shootings. Uh, he did the shootings. He left here. He went north to a town north of Salt Lake, Ogden. He took the freeway across Nevada through Winnemucca, Battle Mountain, Reno, and into San Francisco, and he sold the rifle that he killed the kids at a flea market outside of the Bay Area. Agents and local investigators needed to confirm Herrera's story. If they could find the rifle Franklin had used in Liberty Park, investigators would have the piece they were missing. Detective Bell sent his team to the flea market outside San Francisco. They interviewed gun dealers and other witnesses. So they saturated the flea market and they did come up with witnesses who remembered Joseph Paul Franklin and remembered that he was selling guns. But we could never find the gun. Even without the weapon, Herrera's story was confirmed. Franklin's movements following the murders would be critical for the prosecution. Well, this was pretty good information because we'd never been able, the FBI, ourselves, no one had ever been able to find out where Mr. Franklin had gone after doing the killing. After agents corroborated his story, they met with Herrera again. He told investigators about other crimes Franklin confessed to. Franklin admitted shooting hustler publisher Larry Flint, crippling him in 1977 for portraying black men with white women in his magazine. Franklin also said he shot Vernon Jordan, the president of the National Urban League, in May of 1980. Federal prosecutors felt they had enough to bring the civil rights case to trial. Well, the prosecution was an involved prosecution involving 65 witnesses and approximately 100 different exhibits. Uh, however, we uh, managed to expedite the case and move things along in telling our story and recreating the actions and uh, things that took place. Uh, the trial lasted five and a half days and we were done. The jury deliberated just five hours, finding Joseph Paul Franklin guilty of the federal civil rights violations. The judge sentenced him to two life terms. Franklin was furious that he was going to prison for the rest of his life, but more so because an African-American prosecutor helped put him there. In a rage, Franklin jumped out of his chair and threw water on the attorney. He was quickly subdued by the marshals and carted away. In an interview following his sentencing, Franklin finally admitted to investigators what motivated the killings in Utah and across the country. He said himself that he is a racist, that he had a plan to assassinate as many blacks as he could. This was his whole purpose. After the successful federal trial, the Salt Lake County prosecutor felt he could win a state homicide case against Franklin. 
Franklin was escorted to the courthouse where he had spent the last two months during the federal trial. During a recess, he was left unattended in a holding room. Before the court officer returned, he freed himself and pried the door off its hinges. Franklin had escaped. No one knew how he'd escaped from the holding cell, uh, but when the jailers went to bring him back into court before the jury came in, he wasn't in the conference room. Jail! Jail! It looked as if Joseph Paul Franklin was free once again to continue his path of terror. The elevator was his only way out, and only operable with a guard's key. But a marshal found the control panel dismantled. Franklin had hotwired it using only a dime and a paper clip. He was able to take the plate off the elevator, the prisoner elevator, and strip the wires and call the elevator to that floor. And then he disappeared. Police closed off the streets as jailers searched the courthouse for the fugitive. The rest of us, we immediately put out an area-wide alert that this man had escaped, and we brought every available officer there there was scouring the downtown area. At the same time, the jailer decided that maybe he noticed that the top panel on the elevator had been loosened. So he climbed up on top of the elevator and noticed some movement in the dust and thought, well, somehow he's in this building. So that particular jailer started crawling every single air duct in the courthouse. He found him. Franklin scurried like a rat in the ductwork, always remaining out of his reach. But when Franklin came to the end of the duct, a second guard was waiting. That's a bracelet right here. Well, well. He was back in custody within an hour. Get him out of here. We cleaned him off and combed his hair and brought him back in. And the jury was none the wiser. They just got an extra hour for lunch. Over his next 17 years in prison, Franklin confessed to 16 murders in eight states. In all that time, he never admitted to the double homicide in Cincinnati. Hi. Detective Mike O'Brien never gave up. He continued to build his case, hoping to convict Franklin of the Cincinnati murders. O'Brien's break came when he was able to convince Franklin to interview with Melissa Powers, an assistant district attorney from Cincinnati. The minute that Mr. Franklin walked in the room and sat down, and Ms. Powers introduced herself, told him who, he, who she was, why she was there, he said, you know I did it, I killed those two kids in Cincinnati, immediately as he sat down which was what I've been trying to get him to do for some 17 years, he did in a matter of about 30 seconds. In 1998, Franklin received two more life sentences for the Cincinnati murders. In Missouri, he was sentenced to death for two others. Franklin would never have another opportunity to escape. <coughs> Detective Don Bell remained haunted by Franklin's rampage of violence. And I don't understand this type of killer, that he would actually just take a complete stranger and because of their race and who they were standing by or talking to, he would feel it necessary to kill him. He's one of those, those few people that I just have absolutely no explanation for and uh, I, it's, it's still hard for me to understand. For the families of Franklin's victims, peace had finally come. Franklin would never be free to kill again. FBI, freeze! Get down! FBI, get A family vanishes without a trace. Local authorities find no leads to the identity of their abductors. When stolen weapons began to surface, investigators realized the perpetrators were part of a nationwide rampage of violence. They were dangerous men who would stop at nothing to escape justice.
family was murdered in Arkansas, it seemed like an isolated event. But soon the crime was revealed to be part of an ever-widening circle of violence that defined a new age of domestic terrorism. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. For the killers, the triple homicide in Arkansas was simply a means to an end. They made their way across the country, letting nothing stand between them and their twisted mission. And we would stop at nothing to prevent their rampage. January 1996. Tilly, Arkansas, a small rural neighborhood, was home to William Mueller. Mueller was a gun enthusiast and self-employed electrician. His wife, Nancy, homeschooled their eight-year-old daughter, Sarah. Returning from a day of work, the Muellers were confronted by two men in their home. They were dressed as FBI agents but they were imposters. They were after the large supply of weapons and cash that Mueller had in his home. When the 52-year-old Mueller refused to cooperate, the intruders separated the family and tortured them. Nancy Mueller's mother, Erlene Branch, grew concerned when she hadn't heard from her daughter in two weeks. She turned to the sheriff for help. I usually hear from her at least. She explained that the family often traveled to gun shows, yet her daughter always called when they returned. Although the Mueller's lived in a neighboring county, the sheriff knew the family and agreed to look into the matter. He checked with local authorities and talked to Mueller's neighbors. Though Sheriff Jay Winters found no trace of the family, people who knew them weren't concerned. For the most part, there wasn't a lot of fear. Most people thought, you know, maybe they had just gone off somewhere and, and wanted to be on their own for a while. On February 11th, a month after their disappearance, a farmer found the Mueller's Jeep concealed and abandoned off the highway miles from their home. Detective Aaron Duval from the Pope County Sheriff's Office was sent to investigate. It was approximately 20 miles north of Russellville, uh, off the State Highway 7, hid behind a brush pile. Uh, I was called out that day, went up there, took pictures of the, the uh, vehicle and the trailer. Inside the Jeep, Duval found Nancy Mueller's purse. It held her wallet and ID. The trailer, used by Bill Mueller to transport munitions to gun shows, was empty. Several more months passed, and the Mueller's were still missing. 40 miles from Tilly, an elderly couple enjoyed a day of fishing in a bayou near Russellville. While waiting for a fish to bite, the woman snagged her line. She pulled up an old tennis shoe. A leg bone jutted out of it. Horrified, she cut it loose and went for help. Within hours, search teams combed the bayou organized by Sheriff Winters. They used large metal hooks to drag the bottom. Divers swam the depths. By day's end, parts of a single body were recovered, a murder victim. The torso had a rock attached to it. There was a lot of tape on it. The head had a bag of some type on it, duct tape around the head. Uh, 
very disturbing to us because it was obvious, you know, that that this was a different type of thing than we typically deal with. It was an obvious execution. Uh, it was just some cold-hearted people. Investigators determined it was the body of a small female. They thought it might have been a six-year-old girl who had been abducted several counties away the previous year. When the clothing and size didn't match her description, another possibility became apparent. It could have been Sarah Mueller. The next day, two more partial bodies were found. All three torsos had been weighed down with rocks, and each head was covered with a plastic bag secured with duct tape. Dental records, DNA, and clothing confirmed the identity of the bodies. They were William Mueller, his wife Nancy, and their daughter Sarah. The missing persons case was now a grisly triple homicide investigation. It was bad for Bill and Nancy to have to die the way they did. But for a seven-year-old girl to die that way, to be wrapped with plastic, to be wrapped with duct tape, to have a 60-pound rock strapped to her body and thrown into a lake, there was no excuse. During the autopsy, the coroner determined that the three had probably been in the water since January 11th, the last day they were seen. A later examination revealed several specks of blue paint stuck to the tape that bound the bodies. Investigators sent the paint specks to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. for analysis. Forensic chemists determined that they were consistent with auto paint. The challenge was to match them to a specific make and model. Using infrared light, the examiner established the chemical composition of the paint. This chemical signature was fed into a computer database containing similar information from every auto make, model, and color dating back to 1934. The results gave the Arkansas investigators their first lead. So we thought that the vehicle that the bodies were transported in possibly was blue. It was determined a particular blue color, metallic blue. Uh, the FBI even narrowed it down that it was uh, a General Motors vehicle. Investigators reasoned that they were looking for at least two perpetrators. One must have driven the blue car with the bodies in it to the water, while the other followed in the Mueller's Jeep. By the time they dumped the bodies, the Mueller's were probably already dead, suffocated by the plastic bags. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms from Little Rock, Arkansas was called in. ATF agent Glenn Jordan headed the case. Our jurisdiction uh, lay in the fact that Mueller was a former, former federal firearms licensee, that his firearms were missing, and the fact that Mr. Mueller and his family had been murdered. The ATF had a complete record of Mueller's gun inventory before he forfeited his federal license. With no reports of gun sales since then, agents figured the missing weapons had been stolen. Our goal was to enter the serial numbers of those firearms into the uh, National Crime Information Computer in case those firearms turned up later. Uh, that would give us a lead to follow in the investigation. Jordan was already familiar with Bill Mueller's name since the family had been the victims of a theft one year earlier. At the time of that robbery, Mueller reported $40,000 worth of merchandise stolen, including five firearms and ammunition. Since the Mueller's had been victims of a robbery and homicide within the same year, agents believed that the family had been targeted by a group who used and sold stolen weapons, perhaps members of an anti-government militia. Investigators returned to inspect the Mueller's belongings. 
After the family had disappeared, relatives had taken most of their valuable items. The landlord stored the remaining possessions in his garage. They found a Colt 45 gun case labeled with a serial number, but the gun was missing. They also found a picture of the family with some friends. The ATF entered the serial number of the Colt 45 into the NCIC, the National Crime Information Center. They got a hit. The handgun had been traced to a man named Travis Brake. He had been arrested five months earlier in Seattle, Washington for carrying a concealed weapon. Because the gun he was carrying was now linked to another crime, Brake was arrested again by the Seattle police, this time for possession of a stolen weapon. Jordan and Duval flew to Washington State to question him. Uh, Mr. Brake was interviewed and advised the Seattle Police Department that he had purchased uh, this handgun at a gun show in Seattle, Washington, and he described two individuals that he had purchased the firearm from, one in particularly that he remembered. Investigators showed him the photograph found among the Mueller's possessions. Brake identified one of the men who sold him the gun. That's him. His name was Keith Collins. Agents asked Bill and Nancy Mueller's friends if they had ever heard of him. Collins had once been close with the Mueller's. They had attended gun shows together. Investigators discovered that Keith Collins' real name was Kirby Kehoe. The ATF learned that Kirby Kehoe had an extensive record for firearms violations. Kehoe was also actively involved in the white supremacist movement. Members of this growing faction are strongly anti-government, heavily armed, and considered dangerous. Kirby Kehoe became a prime suspect in the Mueller triple homicide. Investigators needed more evidence before they moved in for an arrest. Almost a year after the triple murder and robbery of Bill, Nancy, and Sarah Mueller, investigators were still hunting for the killers, believed to be militant white supremacists. In Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 11 months after the crime, a trooper noticed a blue Chevy Suburban parked in a handicapped space. found a young couple sleeping inside. The man said his name was Sean Haynes. He and his pregnant girlfriend had pulled over to rest for a while. From the bumper stickers on his truck, the trooper believed he was a white supremacist. He asked Haynes if he was carrying any weapons. Haynes showed him two guns in the back of his vehicle. The trooper called in the serial numbers and discovered they had been stolen. One, an AR-15 rifle, had been taken from the Mueller's house in Arkansas. Haynes was arrested. Alerted that one of Mueller's guns had turned up in South Dakota, investigators from Arkansas went there to interview Haynes. Haynes revealed that he had traded another firearm for the AR-15 rifle at a Washington State motel six months earlier. Explain how they got there. The name of the man he swapped with was Chevy Kehoe, Kirby Kehoe's eldest son. Now Chevy was also connected to the Mueller murders. Investigators weren't through with Haynes, though. They took a paint sample from his blue Suburban. They determined that the sample did not match the paint found on the duct tape wrapped around the Mueller's. 
Haynes had nothing more to offer. The investigation turned to Chevy Kehoe, but he was nowhere to be found. Several weeks later, Ohio State Highway Patrol Officer Harold Harker had a routine assignment to catch speeders in the small town of Wilmington, not far from Cincinnati. While observing traffic, he noticed a blue Chevy Suburban going slower than the speed limit. Parker, a 25-year veteran who was now retired, recalled how he thought the people inside were acting strangely as they drove by. As it approached, I saw it did not have a front license plate. And as it passed me, the, pass, the driver didn't acknowledge my presence in any way, didn't look at the patrol car, just kept both hands on the wheel, fixed straight ahead. However, the passenger not only looked at me as he went by, he actually turned in the seat, looked out the rear window to watch me. Parker knew that Washington State required vehicles to have license plates on both front and back. He called in the plate number and followed the Suburban while waiting for his dispatcher to come back with some information. And they returned and told me that the plate apparently did match the vehicle, however it was expired. So at that point I made the determination that once we got into Wilmington where the berms were wider, I would initiate a traffic stop there. Parker's car was equipped with a video camera mounted on the dashboard. A microphone was fastened to Parker's shirt. Parker asked the passenger and driver for ID. While talking to the men, Harker became more troubled. Neither had any ID. The driver was speaking in a very animated fashion, while the passenger looked straight ahead. At this point, I was concerned enough with my safety and so on. I wanted to get the people away from the vehicle, and I wanted to here again, get them separated, get the, pass get the driver into my car so that I'm a little more in control of their actions. Let's sit back here with a second, sir. The driver eventually followed Harker to his patrol car. You say you borrowed the vehicle? You say you borrowed the vehicle? It's actually what I'll tell you what the process is. Okay. When the officer tried to frisk him, the driver quickly stepped back and became defensive. And he actually moved away from me and used the terminology, I don't want to be violated like that. In 25 years of criminal patrol, operations, I had never had anyone use that particular terminology. And that coupled with the appearance of the two young men, the fact that they were, had close cropped military style haircuts, uh, very clean cut, and the driver had a Marine Corps type cover, I felt comfortable that I was probably dealing with militia personnel at that point. Across the highway, a fellow officer, Deputy Sheriff Robert Gates, saw Harker talking with the driver and turned around to assist him. This was a common practice since officers often worked alone in rural sections of the state. His whole purpose is, is to monitor the entire situation. He doesn't get involved with answering questions, giving direction. That's my job. His job is purely to watch and observe the men told him they were looking for work on construction sites. Parker told the driver that if he or his passenger could not provide identification, their vehicle would be confiscated. The driver attempted to escape. As both officers tried to apprehend him, the passenger jumped from the vehicle and started firing. The passenger fled the scene while Harker tried to stop the driver. His arm became caught in the door, but he managed to free himself. The other suspect escaped into the woods. Gates pursued him. He 
He feared an ambush among the dense trees, so he turned around. his car with a shot out tire called for help. Within moments, the rest of the Wilmington, Ohio Police Department was notified about the shootout. Officer Robert Martin heard the bulletin and then observed a Suburban in an electrical supply company parking lot. He called in his location as he went to investigate. Only 10 6 with that suspect vehicle behind the building supply. The Suburban's driver opened fire. Another policeman arrived to assist him. The suspect had disappeared into the industrial area. He'd shot 32 rounds. One wounded a bystander. Back at the first shootout site, investigators were trying to piece together what happened and to learn the shooter's identities. Using metal detectors, they searched for shell casings. The entire area was meticulously photographed and all evidence collected. The small town of Wilmington had never seen anything like this. Police mobilized a manhunt for the two armed suspects. The search continued into the night. Reinforcements were brought in from neighboring counties. Police knew the suspects would resort to violence in order to escape. They had to find them before anyone was killed. The suspects in the shootout were still at large. The ATF and Ohio State Police examined the second gunfight location in the Chevy Suburban. The entire crime scene was processed for fingerprints in hopes of determining the shooter's identity. Inside the vehicle were assault rifles, thousands of rounds of ammunition, military supplies, and medical packs. Investigators traced the munitions through receipts supplied by the manufacturers. Much of the ammo and gun parts belonged to the murdered Arkansas gun dealer, William Mueller. The extent of the military supplies suggested the shooters were violent members of an anti-government group. Ohio investigators notified the FBI. FBI agent Bill Hargraves from the Cincinnati field office spearheaded the investigation. The case became a domestic terrorism case basically because of the items that were found in the suburban. They had numerous weapons, ammunition, law enforcement, clothing and equipment, law enforcement identification. Yes, this is Trooper Herman with uh, Ohio State Police. Ohio State Troopers traced the Suburban's registration to a man named Jacob Settle from Spokane, Washington. On the day of the shootout, Settle told the trooper he was with friends in Washington State, more than 2,000 miles from Ohio. He also claimed that he had sold the vehicle to a man named Chevy Kehoe. It would take several days for authorities to corroborate Settle's story. Ohio State troopers compared a copy of Settle's driver's license photo against images of the fugitives caught on tape. The picture didn't match. The videotape was their best clue. Ohio State Police released the tape nationwide to try to find the shooter's identities. The shootout video made primetime news around the country and produced the break investigators needed. 
A Washington State TV reporter recognized the driver as a white supremacist she had interviewed several years earlier for the TV show Hard Copy. He does look His name was Chevy Keel. Several cops and residents confirmed the identification. Back in Arkansas, Pope County investigators working on the Mueller triple homicide also watched the video. For the first time, they saw Chevy Kehoe. They assisted Ohio State and federal investigators in the manhunt, since Chevy was also a suspect in the Arkansas murders. Duval and Jordan traveled to Ohio to meet with FBI agent Hargraves to share information. They told Hargraves that the killers used a blue General Motors vehicle to transport the victims. Hargrave thought the connection was strong since the truck abandoned after the shootout was a blue Chevy Suburban and more of Mueller's property was found inside. The team agreed that if paint scrapings from the Suburban matched the blue paint specks found on the victims, they would have forensic evidence tying Chevy Kehoe to the Arkansas crimes. At the FBI lab in Washington, D.C., Examiners determined that the paint specs did not match the sample found in Arkansas. FBI agent Jim Shenandoah was called in, a specialist in tracking domestic terrorists like Chevy Kehoe. We found out that they had engaged in militia-type activities, that they had uh, uh, anti-government views, they were very anti-law enforcement at the time. So it really heightened the, the security in terms of, uh, of what these uh, suspects were going to do next. Seeking more information on Chevy Kehoe, a Washington state trooper interviewed his father, Kirby, at his home in Colesville. The trooper asked him if he recognized the men in the video. Kirby did not identify his son, Chevy, but he said the second man was his younger son, Shane. We found this unusual because the video made it fairly easily to identify the driver who was Chevy, but not quite as easy to identify Shane. We thought that perhaps there might have been some favoritism for one son over the other. The FBI looked into the background of 23-year-old Chevy and 21-year-old Shane Kehoe. Chevy Kehoe was linked to a variety of, of crimes. In addition to the three murders in Arkansas, he was linked to a murder in, in Washington State and a murder, in, we believe, in Idaho. He also committed a, a series of burglaries, uh, robberies, and uh, extortions. Uh, and also interstate transportation of stolen property. APBs were issued for the Keogh brothers. On February 18th, investigators picked up the Kehoe's trail in Frankfort, Ohio, 45 miles from the shootout site in Wilmington. A Chevy Monte Carlo was found abandoned in a grocery store parking lot. It had been reported stolen a mile from where the shootout occurred. Authorities suspected that at least one of the Kehoes had stolen it to escape the manhunt. The keys were all the robber had left. Investigators feared the desperate brothers would stop at nothing to escape custody. State police fanned out to canvas the area, hoping someone may have seen one of the fugitives. A mile away at the Lake Hill campground, the Kehoe's path re-emerged. Investigators learned that the pair had camped there with their families in an RV. But authorities arrived too late. Just two days earlier, the motorhome had pulled out. No one knew if the brothers were on board. The FBI released a nationwide APB for the vehicle. As the weeks passed, people reported sightings of the RV. They had also seen women and children in the camper. E. 
Each time authorities responded, the camper was gone. The Kehoe's trail heated up again 150 miles away in Indianapolis, Indiana, where another stolen vehicle was recovered. Inside, investigators found clothing and a gas receipt signed by Chevy Kehoe, but no trace of his brother Shane. The van had been stolen 13 miles from where Chevy fled the Blue Suburban after firing on Ohio officers. The Keos were still one step ahead. The trail of plundered cars signaled that the Kehoe's crime spree would not cease until authorities stopped them. We felt early on that if confronted again by law enforcement that there would be a great probability that there would be another shooting involved and that uh, innocent people would, uh, would be hurt. Across the country, local and federal investigators were put on high alert. They needed to find the Kehoe brothers before they struck again. In Arizona, a state trooper came upon an RV that fit the description of the Kehoe's camper. It had no license plates, and its shades were drawn. He called in reinforcements. He knew the brothers were armed and dangerous and would shoot to kill. Within moments, a SWAT team surrounded the RV. They hoped the nighttime assault would catch the Keos off guard and lessen the chances of another armed confrontation. An Arizona SWAT team was on the move to catch the Kehoe brothers. Armed fugitives wanted in two states for murder and attempted murder. Freeze! They thought they had them cornered. It was the wrong RV. Several days later, a Wyoming highway patrolman found the Kehoe's mobile home broken down and abandoned on a desolate stretch of road. The FBI was informed and asked that the RV be towed into town for inspection. The Wyoming State Police obtained a warrant and documented its contents. This vehicle, like the Suburban, held a large cache of ammunition, guns, several fake FBI jackets, and U.S. Marshals badges. One discovery stopped the officers in their tracks. Hey, come take a look at this. A box of explosive components, yeah, including mine. batteries used to detonate bombs. Fearing a booby trap, the troopers called in the ATF bomb squad. Nearby business and government offices were evacuated. Inch by inch, the bomb squad probed the RV. The thorough investigation revealed no live devices. But the danger wasn't over. According to ATF agent Jordan, the Kehoe brothers had a well-equipped bomb factory, which increased their potential for violence. The bomb-making components that we found consisted of uh, some metal cylinders, uh, several types of chemicals, uh, mixing uh, bowls, uh, hot plate, coffee filters, uh, instructions for making homemade blasting caps, uh, uh, quite an assortment of, of bomb-making components. Receipts on board revealed the family's path since leaving Ohio. They traveled through West Virginia, North Carolina, Alabama, Texas, and Montana before ditching the mobile home in Wyoming. The vehicle offered few clues to the Kehoe's current location. All we knew was that Chevy was last known to be in Indianapolis where the stolen van was recovered. We presumed that Shane and the families had made it as far as Casper 
where the camper had broken down. From that point on, we basically had a cold trail. To entice the public's help, the FBI and ATF announced that they had joined to offer a reward for the pair's arrest and conviction. The fact that it was a serious matter involving law enforcement, uh, the fact that they had some affiliation to uh, supremacy groups, and, uh, and the fact that uh, they were dangerous individuals, we were able to uh, obtain a, a $60,000 reward for their apprehension. More than 100 tips came in. The local leads were handled by the Ohio State Police, while the FBI and ATF pursued those from out of state. On June 16th, investigators got the news they were hoping for. A sheriff in Stevens County, Washington, received a call from a friend of Shane Kehoe. Shane wanted to turn himself in. The 21-year-old surrendered to the authorities and informed them where he and his brother had been for the last few months. After the Wilmington shootout, Shane had stolen a car and returned to the campground. There, he gathered his and his brother's families and drove to Wyoming, where he met Chevy. Soon after the Kehos were reunited, the RV broke down. Chevy told investigators that he and his brother had finally found refuge with their families on a remote ranch in rural southern Utah. A farmer and his wife had taken them in and offered them room and board in exchange for doing work on the ranch. Soon the situation began to deteriorate. Chevy couldn't control his explosive temper. Both Shane and his wife, Tana, grew concerned. Chevy talked of building his own white supremacist order. He thought of killing his wife, Karina, because of Native American ancestry in her family. He even talked of murdering his own parents, Kirby and Gloria, in order to raise his six younger brothers with his beliefs. On June 12th, almost four months after the shootouts in Ohio, Chevy finally turned his growing paranoia on his own brother. Shane explained to us that they had recently gotten into a fight and that he feared for his life as well as the lives of his family. Shane also told investigators that Chevy had several items in his possession that belonged to the Mueller's. Chevy had also admitted to suffocating the Mueller family. Not knowing what Chevy would do next, Shane and his family fled Utah in the middle of the night, driving almost a thousand miles back to Washington State. Authorities inspected the truck Shane drove, looking for additional evidence. Lab examiners discovered that the vehicle, which belonged to Chevy Kehoe, had been repainted from its original blue color. FBI forensic chemist Ron Meddled explains. We often see repainted vehicles in the laboratory here, and we can determine how it was originally painted. The layers of paint can many times be thought of as a stack of cards that is loosely adhered to each other. Okay, and any one card can be withdrawn from the layer and sampled individually. So the Ace of Diamonds, which is a primer layer, would be different in chemistry and color from the King of Spades, which would be on top. The test results were conclusive. The composition of the blue paint found on the Kehoe's vehicle matched the specks found on the Mueller's bodies. The evidence against Chevy Kehoe was compelling but capturing him would be no easy task. Investigators would have to travel to Chevy's remote hideout in Utah, where an arrest team could be seen approaching from miles away. Wanted for triple homicide in Arkansas and attempted murder in Ohio, the white supremacist Chevy Kehoe was heavily armed and hiding with his family on an isolated ranch. Apprehending the criminal in the wide open spaces of southern Utah would be dangerous for agents 
and Chevy's family. The FBI and ATF needed an arrest plan that minimized the risk. Agent Will Long was in charge of coordinating the plan. He is in shadow in order to protect the sensitive nature of his current case. Chevy's children and his wife were there, and uh, we certainly didn't want to get involved in a situation where they were in the middle uh, of, a, of a shooting situation or possible hostage situation. Long enlisted the help of Rodney Levitt, the farmer on whose land the brothers had been living. Levitt agreed to help the FBI due to his concern for Chevy's children. He told us that on a regular basis, Chevy Kehoe would, at his request, travel into Cedar City to run errands for him related to the farming operation. And uh, in this case, they had previously talked about Chevy coming into town on this day to uh, pick up some feed from the local feed store. And uh, we decided that we could use that as an opportunity to take him uh, at the feed store in, in an environment that we could control. That left agents only two hours to get into position before Chevy arrived in town with Levitt. Two hours is a short amount of time. We placed surveillance units along the road that would be in a position to call out the location of Chevy Kehoe and Mr. Levitt as they made their way into town. The plan was working perfectly until Chevy Kehoe made an unscheduled stop. The FBI didn't know if Kehoe was on to them and was making a run for it. The agent on location radioed in for assistance. He waited for instructions to apprehend Kehoe or get Levitt to safety. For a few breathless moments, no one knew what would happen next. Chevy returned to the truck with a soda. To the undercover agent, it seemed that Chevy had no suspicions and returned to the road. Back in town, more than 25 agents waited for the arrival of Chevy and Levitt. Snipers were positioned on the rooftops and the feed store was surrounded. Agents were also located in the nearby neighborhood. Their objective was to prevent Chevy from escaping and taking hostages. While Agent Long loaded hay in front of the feed store, his plan nearly went awry. As we were listening to the radio, we heard one of the surveillance units call out that Chevy had crossed a landmark that was approximately one minute away from the feed store. At that very moment, a farmer unwittingly pulled into the parking spot the FBI was holding for Chevy. Agent Long had a split second to act. Sir, I need to... Oh, I ran across the parking lot with my badge and credentials in my hand. I told this man that a dangerous fugitive was about to pull into the parking lot and that we were going to arrest him right here and that he needed to immediately get in his vehicle and, and get out of the parking lot. The farmer complied and Long returned to his position. Seconds later, Chevy Kehoe pulled into the parking lot. FBI, get on the ground! Get down on the ground! Get down on the ground! Long and his team pounced on the suspected murderer, leaving him no time to reach for a concealed weapon. After five months of a nationwide manhunt, the FBI had finally captured Chevy Kehoe. Back at the ranch, there was still the matter of taking Chevy's wife, Karina, and their three kids into custody. Once again, Levitt offered his help. Apparently, Mr. Levitt had an injured back and Karina would routinely come out and open the gate for Mr. Levitt to let him into the property uh, as a courtesy to him because of his injury. To open the gate, Karina had to leave the house, giving agents the opportunity to arrest her. 
Long hid in the back of the truck with two other agents. Just as we anticipated, Karina came out and opened the gate. And as she was looking at the gate and concentrating on manipulating the latch, uh, we jumped out of the back of the truck and uh, immediately searched her and found a loaded 9mm pistol in her back pocket. Get out on the ground, ma'am. Get out on the ground. Get out on the ground. Spread your legs. Spread your arms. Long obtained a search warrant for the Kehoe's trailer on the Levitt property. Okay. Before inspecting it, the FBI safely escorted the children outside and entrusted them to the farmer. Back inside, Long discovered a well-stocked armory. Chevy Kehoe, anticipating a siege, had stationed loaded guns at every window. With both brothers finally in custody, the pair was transported back east to face 16 state and local charges. Chevy would first be tried in Arkansas on federal charges. With the Kehoes locked up, U.S. Attorney Paula Casey had several months to prepare a solid case. The federal agents and Aaron Duvall, Jay Winters, came here and they laid out the evidence they had of all the various crimes that had been committed. And after we examined everything that was there, there was sort of this growing realization as we reviewed these things that it was a racketeering case. Placing Chevy's illegal activities under a racketeering umbrella, Casey needed to demonstrate that crimes were committed in order to expand his white supremacist movement. The racketeering statute lets us give a jury the complete picture of what happened. It lets us put that together so that all of the evidence can be placed before the jury for their decision. Chevy Kehoe was ultimately charged with 57 federal crimes, including the brutal murder of Bill and Nancy and their eight-year-old daughter, Sarah. Chevy Kehoe was tried, and following a three-month jury trial, he was found guilty of racketeering and as a result of his conviction, he received a sentence of life without the possibility of parole because in the federal system, there is no parole. As for Brother Shane, despite his claims of self-defense, he was found guilty of the state charges brought against him. Among them, attempted murder for the shootout in Wilmington. He is currently serving 24 and a half years. The reason I think every agency was so cooperative in, in working on this was just that it was, it was a, a horrible crime. It was a crime that was obviously hard for anybody to figure out why it happened, uh, exactly how it would happen. It was just one of those things that everybody wanted to help out and they knew that we couldn't do it all ourselves and if it had been their case, they wouldn't have been able to do it by themselves either. So it was just a matter of everybody getting together because the bottom line was there were some bad people out there and everybody just needed to get involved in, for a common cause and that was to put the bad guy behind bars.